Hello my friends, this video is the English version of the lesson taught by Dr. Juan Blues. And remember, you won't find another video on YouTube that explains it better than we do here. Today, we're going to learn about epithelial tissue. Each slide resumes the most important points of each theme, and the drawings are designed to reinforce learning, so that it will be easier for you to remember each lesson. We hope that you find them useful. Let's begin! Let's start at the very beginning. In the fertilization process, the sperm and the egg unite to form a single cell, called the egg cell, or zygote. This cell, not specialized in anything, begins to develop, to proliferate, and to differentiate itself. And each one of the new cells will develop in a different way, preparing itself and adapting its structure to fulfill a specific function. The cells which are similar to each other and which have a similar purpose will start grouping together to form different tissues. So, tissue is a group of cells with a similar structure, which group themselves together to perform the same function. And this group of cells is called tissue. In turn, the different tissues will group together to form organs. And when different organs group together to perform the same function, we're talking about systems. To make things clear, here's an example. Here we have a cell which ended up specialising in generating and conducting electrical impulses. We call it a nerve cell, or neuron. There are different types of neurons, but they all have common group characteristics. And when these different nerve cells group together to perform a collective task, they form tissue. In this case, nervous tissue. If we look at the drawing, we can see the combination of different types of tissue. Here, for example, we have a piece of nervous tissue, connective tissue, blood tissue, etc. By grouping together, the different tissue types form an organ, in this case, the brain. And going up a level, the combination of different organs with the same function and purpose forms systems, in this case, the nervous system. Good. So in this video, we're going to stay at tissue level. And the science which studies tissues is called histology. So I ask you, what kinds of human tissues can we find? How many exist? We have four kinds of fundamental tissues from which all others are created. And our bodies are formed of a combination of these. The four types are nervous tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and the protagonist of today's video, epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is a tissue composed of close-knit cells with little extracellular matrix in between them. Epithelial cells are responsible for covering surfaces thus achieving the purpose of protecting structures. We will also see that they line passages and therefore help to channel the transport of substances. And that they can also improve the capacity to absorb nutrients. Let's look at this process in closer detail. What are the principal characteristics of the epithelia, or of the epithelial tissue in general? Look, these are epithelial cells which, as we can see, group together to form epithelial tissue. Let's analyse the drawing. What can we see? 1. They possess one layer, or various layers of cells, very close together. And to achieve this, they use different kinds of adhesion molecules. 2. Therefore, there is little or no intercellular substance separating them. 3. They lack blood supply. 4. Nevertheless, underlying the epithelia, that's to say, underneath them, there is highly vascularized and innervated connective tissue. 5. The lower area, or base surface of the epithelia, rests on a structure known as a basement membrane, which separates it and links it with the underlying connective tissue that we've just discussed. It's worth mentioning that the basement membrane is composed of a basal lamina and a reticular lamina. 6. The epithelial cells present morphofunctional polarity. That's to say that depending on the region or zone of the epithelial cell, they can carry out different functions. Therefore, the plasma membrane of the epithelial cells is divided into three domains or regions, which differ in composition and proteins, and, as we mentioned, in the functions they perform. We have the apical domain, the lateral domain or area, and the basal domain. 7. The epithelial tissue originates from the three germ layers. It comes from the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And now that we know its histological features, how can we explain epithelial tissue? Well, epithelial tissue can be found in two different forms, 
That's to say that it can subspecialize into two types. One, by becoming covering and lining epithelium. Or two, by forming specific structures called glands, in which case they are known as glandular epithelium. The epithelium which acts as a coating is that which covers and lines all the external and internal surfaces of the organism, performing functions of protection, transport, absorption or sensory functions. For example, on the external surface of the organism, the epithelium makes up the epidermis or top layer of the skin, as we all know. But the fact is that epithelial tissue also covers the surfaces of body cavities and closed conducts, which do not communicate with the exterior, such as the pleural cavity, the pericardial cavity, or the peritoneal cavity. We also have epithelial tissue lining our arteries and the veins which form the cardiovascular system and also the tubes which connect with the exterior, such as the digestive tract, the genitourinary tract or the respiratory tract, which are also lined with epithelium. And in the case of glandular epithelium, this is formed during the development of the embryo. The epithelia generate evaginations in the underlying connective tissue, forming glands with secretory function. But how exactly are the glands formed? And what are the two principal types? Look, this is the covering and lining epithelium. And this, underneath, which is supporting it, is the connective tissue. We already mentioned that this is the tissue through which nutrients are passed, because all epithelium are avascular. And what happens? Well, during embryonic development, some of the epithelium which cover the surface invaginate. They fold into the underlying connective tissue. Some sink deeper and others sink less. We can see that some glands maintain the connection with the epithelium that they originated from, forming ducts. And this is important. These ducts originate from this epithelial coating surface and joined to them is the secretory unit of the gland, or adenomere. The two units, both the duct and the secretory portion, make up the parenchyma of the gland. And in this case, the surrounding connective tissue is called stroma. Meanwhile, we see that there are other invaginations which penetrate much more deeply in the connective tissue and lose their connection with the surface which they originated from. They do not have ducts, and they form groups of cells, which can be arranged in cellular accumulations or by forming follicles. Good, so this is the main division when it comes to types of glands that we should know for the moment. Because what we have just explained classifies glandular epithelial tissue in two types. We say that according to the destination of the products which are secreted by the glands, and this is obviously influenced by their shape, they are either exocrine glands or endocrine glands. Exocrine glands secrete their substance onto the exterior of an epithelial surface. This could be a closed cavity, such as the exocrine portion of the pancreatic gland which secretes into the intestine, for example, or towards an open cavity, such as the sweat gland, which secretes sweat towards the external epithelial surface of the skin. The majority of exocrine glands have a system of ducts towards the exterior. These are called excretory ducts and the endocrine glands pump their secretions directly into the blood or lymph and from there to the target place where they will take effect. As we can see, these do not have excretory ducts and how do they drain their content into the bloodstream if we asserted that all types of epithelial tissue are avascular? Well, they discharge it via diffusion to the surrounding connective tissue which does have blood vessels. Today, we're not going to look at the glandular epithelium Today we are going to explain this, covering and lining epithelium, which, as we mentioned, covers the different surfaces of the body and therefore carries out different functions. But at some point during today's video, we will see how covering and lining epithelium also covers the surfaces of the ducts of the exocrine glands or even the surface of the interior of follicles in endocrine glands. And now you know why. It is clear to us, right? So let's look at the epithelial tissue which covers surfaces. What types are there? How can we classify them? The classification of the epithelium. The classification of the epithelium is based principally on the quantity of cell layers and the form of cells on the surface layer. And we can also add the classification specific modifications of its apical region. Let's take a look. Depending on the number of layers or cell strata, the epithelia can be simple epithelium, when it has just one layer of thickness or a single cell strata, Stratified epithelium, when it has two or more cell strata. 
and according to the geometric shape of the cells on the surface layer, the epithelium can be squamous epithelium, when the most superficial cells are flat or squamous. That's to say that the length and width of the cell are much greater than its depth. Cuboidal epithelium, when the most superficial cells are cubic or cuboid. That's cube-shaped. That's to say that the width, height and depth of the cell are approximately equal. Columnar epithelium, when the most superficial cells are cylindrical, or in the form of a column. This means that the height is greater than the width or the depth. Therefore, grouping together these possible combinations, we can have a simple epithelium, that's to say it only has one layer of cells, and these can be squamous, simple squamous epithelium, cuboidal, simple cuboidal epithelium, or columnar, simple columnar epithelium. And we can also have a stratified squamous epithelium, a stratified cuboidal, or a stratified columnar epithelium. Observe that these all have several cell layers or strata, and the cells of the last layer have a flat, cubic or columnar shape, respectively. Good, so as well as these categories, there are two special classifications for epithelium. Pseudostratified epithelium. In this, all the cells rest on the basement membrane, that's to say, there's only one layer of cells. But what occurs? They are all different heights. If you look, you will see that the nuclei are at different levels, and when seen through the optical microscope, this makes it look as if there were several layers. Although this is not the case, there is only one layer. That's why it's called a pseudo or falsely stratified epithelium, because it's really a simple epithelium. And we also have a transitional epithelium, polymorph or urothelium. This is a stratified epithelium. Here there are various layers or stratas with specific characteristics, such as the variation of the epithelial surface. This epithelium covers the urinary tract and extends from the minor calyx of the kidney to the proximal segment of the urethra. It's an epithelium which is exclusive to the urinary tract. It can only be found here, and we will study it later. And now, we are going to explain in greater depth the different types of epithelium we have in the diagram, and the parts of the body where these can usually be found. And all with illustrations to make it easier. We'll see you in the next chapter, Epithelial Tissue Part 2. Goodbye for now.